Hello everyone and welcome to Chairside Live. I'm your host, Megan Strong. What a great show we have for you today. Our newest Chairside Live contributor is here. Dr. Samira Hushiar is joining me at the news desk to introduce an exciting new segment for Chairside Live. Then, Gary the Lawyer is back to discuss everyone's favorite topic, arbitration and arbitration agreements. But first, come with me to the news desk to chat with Dr. Hushiar. Today we're going to talk about her background in dentistry and we'll also discuss what you can look forward to in upcoming segments with her. She's got some great insight and I'm excited for you to get to know her. So let's go meet her. Hello everyone and welcome in. I'm here today with the newest contributor to Chairside Live, Dr. Samira Hushiar. How are you doing? Great, thank you. How great. are you? Great, I'm glad to have you here. Thank so you. So we're going to be talking today about our upcoming segments with Dr. Hushiar, but first, before we dive into that, I want to talk a little bit about your experience in dentistry. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the way I got into dentistry, I pretty much grew up in a family of healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. So my passion for helping others and um, getting into the sciences grew very early on. Um, I, I was very determined and focused to study the sciences, so I got my bachelor's in biology from UC Irvine, and I did some volunteering research, and I decided to go into the field of dentistry. Mm -hmm. um, I got my doctoral in dental surgery from UCLA, and I graduated in 2001. Go Bruins! <laughs> yes. And so um, from there, I mean, like many women out there, I sort of juggled my career on the side and also my family. Um, in fact, when I graduated from UCLA, mm -hmm. I was two months pregnant. Wow. Yes. And now I have three beautiful daughters that I'm very proud of. Nice. I was um, very much interested in dentistry for many reasons. Um, one of the reasons was the fact the artistic part of it interested me and um, also the fact that it gave the freedom for me to set my own hours and be able to have my family. I knew early on I wanted to raise a family so that was also very appealing to me. Nice, okay. And so um, as we go forward with this segment uh, with you coming on Chairside Live, can you tell us a little bit about what we're going to be talking about? I'm very excited to look at um, some of the demographics of women in dentistry and how that's been changing over the few decades. I would love to give you a little bit of stat on that, some of the ADA stats. Sure, please. Um, uh, for example, men number about 71.1% in 2015 versus mm -hmm. uh, the 84% in 2001. Wow. And female dentists in 2015 numbered about 28.9% mm -hmm. versus the 16% in wow. 2001. So as you can see, the change in a number of women entering into the dental field has increased dramatically over the few decades. Sure, so in, 15, in about 15 years, according to that particular study, it's grown tremendously. And I think you were telling me before that now uh, dental school applicants are about 50 50 percent on male and female so it's the females are entering the dental industry and field in growing numbers and that's really an exciting trend it is it's very exciting i think women are also noticing as i noticed way back when that um dentistry is still one of the most independent um health professions in the u.s um, and being able to go into sole practice is huge. So women are also interested in that because of the flexibility it has in the hours. You can be your own boss mm -hmm. and raise a family on the side. And I think that in combination of all that is very important. Sure, and you've been able to do that. You owned your own practice. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience once you became a dentist? Sure, yes. Um, like I said, I was pregnant when I graduated, That's so crazy. children have always been part of my mm -hmm. life. But I was able to do um, um, not just work part-time, but also do some continuing education. I actually um, studied my cosmetic dentistry at, at uh, Las Vegas Institute, LVI, yeah. and also I went into implantology and, and did an 11-month course where I was able to, I was fortunate enough to be able to go every month for about four days a month mm -hmm. for 11 months and get my assistant fellowship in implantology. Wow. So that was also something that I um, wanted to pursue. Mm -hmm. And in 2005, I opened my own practice here in Irvine. And um, for about three years, I started from scratch and I built it to a point where it grew so big, I, I, it was a little bit getting out of my hand because mm -hmm. I was pregnant with my second child at the time. Ooh. So I did sell my practice, yeah. 
But that didn't stop me. I continued and I worked as an associate. Mm -hmm. So I've always had um, the opportunity and the freedom to do my career on the side, whether it was in solo practice or as an associate. Awesome. Can you tell us a little more besides, you know, the growing trends of women in dentistry? Um, I know that you wanted to talk a little, about, a little bit about in upcoming segments about um, women and men in uh, different specialties. Can you tell us a little yes. bit about that? Well, one of the things I'm um, looking forward to discuss in the future segments is um, how the number of enrollment uh, women enrolling into dental school is increasing mm -hmm. and how that has affected um, the profession. Um, and also, I also want to compare that why, um, how come that the percentage of women going into specialty after dental school is still less than men and how that has impacted um, women and their family life. Um, another thing that I would love to discuss in the future is um, the leadership roles that women are taking in, in the field of dentistry mm -hmm. and how that has motivated um, dentists, other females that are hesitant to get into leadership positions. Um, and it would be a great idea to also discuss um, the differences in gender in mm -hmm. dentistry and some of the similarities as well and how that can contribute to the profession going forward. Great. Well, we're at a time of change in dentistry, and I'm glad that you're here to talk with us through this. And so we look forward to future episodes with Dr. Hushiar coming up. Thank Stay you. tuned. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Well, I hope you enjoyed meeting Dr. Hushiar, and you can look forward to upcoming segments with her in the near future. But next up, I'm heading back to the news desk, but this time, Gary the Lawyer is joining me to discuss arbitration. We're talking critical questions like, do you need to have your patients sign an arbitration agreement? Let's find out. Hello everyone and welcome in. I'm here with Gary the Lawyer, a CSL favorite. Thank you for joining <laughs> us today. Thank you, Megan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And today we're talking about a very important question that we receive a lot here, which is, should I require my patients to sign an arbitration agreement? What are your thoughts? First, let's talk about what is arbitration and then let's address that question. Okay, good. Good question, Dr. Megan. Oh, wow, <laughs> that's got a nice ring to it. I like it. And you don't have to go to school. Should you have an arbitration agreement? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And I get that question quite a bit. Sure. First, let's define what arbitration is. Let's do it. Right. Arbitration is really a form of alternative dispute resolution. So there's a jury trial in, fr in front of a jury with a judge. Yeah. Right? That's what we call litigation, sure. litigating the case. There's an arbitration. Uh, you can have an agreement between the, between the parties to arbitrate a case, and that would be if, so, if the both parties had signed an arbitration agreement. Okay. Right? And, then, um, and then maybe uh, mediation is other ways to resolve a complaint, but, but uh, arbitration uh, is usually a binding, um, the result is binding. So whatever the arbitrator decides, mm -hmm. Um, would be final and would, that would be then enforceable through a, a court of law uh, so that, that judgment then could be collected on. Um, and, and it's really, a, it's a private individual that does the arbitration. It's not a, um, it's a, not a judge, it may be a former judge. Sure. But, um, and, and, both and then there's no jury. Agree, both parties agree on the arbitrator, correct? Well, uh, yeah, well, and there's different arbitration selection provisions depending okay. on depending on what mediation rules you're using. Okay. But yes, generally both parties will will have an opportunity to strike certain arbitrators, sure. and you can go back and look at the history of what that arbitrator has has uh, awarded in the past, mm -hmm. which may be very enlightening. Yes, right? and you would want to know that. Your your but your lawyer will take care of that once it once it gets rolling. Sure. So it's it's really just and and the advantage of of arbitration is that it's typically it's it's cheaper than full blown litigation. Okay, um, the evidence rules are relaxed relaxed a little bit, and uh, it's usually much faster than going through um, the typical courtroom route. Okay, how long would a typical arbitration case maybe last? You know, you, know, you, could, probably, you could probably get a, a resol an arbitration resolved typically in under a year, whereas okay. sometimes you, you can be in, in court for five years. Now, all this, all this varies, and it's sure, just, it course. really depends. Yeah, great. And so, sh I mean, what, to answer that question, should they require their patients to sign an arbitration agreement? Right, and I wish I could just tell you, uh, yes, Megan, require an so arbitration. it's not black and white. It's not black and okay. white, no. It's going, to be exp it's going to be hard and expensive, right? <laughs> <laughs> what everybody the, wants to hear. To give you the answer for sure. this, right? There's no good. There's no good litigation, right? So, right. Um, so the only good good litigation is a closed and done litigation, mm -hmm. right? And the only way to get litigation resolved is to have a judgment or an arbitration uh, go, or have have the uh, judge kick it out. 
Mm -hmm. Which is another downside sometimes of arbitration is because of the relaxed evidentiary rules. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of times um, the arbitrator will will uh, not have the strict requirements. And so if you're if you're a, a defendant in a malpractice action, you may want very strict requirements sure. <laughs> about what about what comes in mm -hmm. to evidence. So that's gonna be that can be a downside of arbitration. Right. And what about requiring your employees to sign an arbitration agreement? Okay. No, another area where arbitration can be used is is employment. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a um, it's it's uh, it can be a good idea to have and again it depends but it can be a good idea to have your employees sign an arbitration agreement. Uh, a lot of um, states there's different requirements though and so this this is a state by state inquiry. Sure. Uh, a lot of states will require additional consideration. So you can't just come up to an employee who's been there 10 years and go here sign this. Right. There won't be adequate consideration for that. You have to give that in context of some kind of a raise or promotion here that and that comes with this arbitration agree agreement. And then it's, again, if you want arbitration, it's um, what you should try to do is, is sell that arbitration agreement a little bit. You know, I'm hoping that this, if we ever do have a dispute, you know, heavens, um, you know, please don't have a dispute. But right. if we ever do, uh, we can get this resolved quicker and less formally through an arbitration procedure. Right. So it may sound attractive to an employee or a patient. Right. It, it may be attractive. I think, though, also, though, there's a lot of a lot of negative press now about arbitration agreements. Sure. And in fact, some legislatures around the country and there's some federal push to uh, actually do away with arbitration agreements in certain contexts. Mm -hmm. So the, the, um, the worry there, I think, from the legislator's mind mm -hmm. is that arbitration can take unfair advantage of, of a person and deny them of their right to the jury trial. Okay. Right. And so right. there's a, a little bit of a, a push there. And so a little bit of, and so people have heard of that and may be cautious about signing those arbitration agreements. I'm not going to sign your agreement, Dr. Right. Megan. Sure. Dr. Megan, look at that again. <laughs> it's so nice. You know, and I think that maybe uh, the dispute that a patient may have or the reserve, they might be reserved in coming to a doctor who requires their patients to sign an arbitration agreement is, well, okay, then are you viewing me as a potential lawsuit instead of a patient? And so I could see where maybe a patient would kind of object to it. So I think what you were saying about selling the arbitration agreement uh, was very important otherwise because of how you word it so that the patient doesn't feel like they're just worried I'm going to sue them right. and they don't care about me as a patient. Exactly right. And I've seen dentists do d different things. I mean, some some require I'm not going to have you as a patient unless you sign my arbitration agreement, right? right. But an another position is here as an arbitration is offered to you. Mm -hmm. Some of our patients like it. You know, if you don't want it, that doesn't mean we're not going to treat you. Yeah. Um, so you, there can be some fallback positions. But sometimes your medical malpractice insurance carrier may require that you get an arbitration agreement signed. Okay. So all right, so can we sum it up in a couple bullet points for of today's conversation? Yes. <laughs> we can. Let's sum it yes, up. Yes, the answer is yes. Let's Here are the bullet points. <laughs> Shoot away. Let's sum it up. You know, if you have, if you can re ask somebody to sign an arbitration agreement, mm -hmm. a lot of times there's some advantages to that because then it allows your attorney, once the case is filed, to decide, hey, do I want to get this into arbitration mm -hmm. or do, would I rather have a judge? Because typically a plaintiff attorney will file in court hoping that the threat of a jury, jury. you know, a runaway jury verdict will, will, be force, loud enough. will force the insurer into settlement or you into settlement, mm -hmm. right? But, um, but depending on the case, your attorney may want to get that in arbitration. And if you have a signed arbitration agreement, that will allow him to, to make that decision at that time. And that's probably the best way to look at it. Awesome. Gary, as always, it's always a pleasure to have you with us and we look forward to your next segment on Chairside Live. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Chairside Live. On behalf of everyone here at Glywell Laboratories, we thank you for watching, and I'll meet you right back here next time.